Good evening, YouTube. This is your guy, J. Crew to you, coming at you with a bit of an overdue video here. I know it's been maybe a week or so since I got on the horn here to do a video. As I said, you know what? Time for me to get back on the horn and do another video. Um, gonna do a video about um, uh, our state's college football team, uh, you, the University of Georgia Bulldogs, and how they absolutely got spanked this past weekend by the Alabama Crimson Tide, as everybody possibly knows. I'm going to give my opinion on that game, and I'm also going to just talk about the state of the Bulldogs in general in terms of what I think is wrong, uh, you know, with what they're doing, these big games. And it's it's probably along the lines of what you see maybe a few other YouTubers talk about and uh, probably what you probably think uh, yourself is going wrong there at UGA. And um, uh, just want to, you know, talk about, you know, what I think, you know, is the major problems and uh, what they need to do to fix it and how the head coach's mindset is part of those problems. Let me go ahead and get this out of the way. Is it, For anybody who watched uh, the Alabama and University of Georgia uh, conference championship game this past weekend in Atlanta, Georgia, you know that Alabama just really just uh, put a spanking on, on the Georgia Bulldogs. That game was competitive maybe for like a quarter, a quarter and a half, and then Alabama pretty much just kind of put their foot down and let everybody know why they're the best college football program there has been probably over the past decade in college sports. Um, you know, most people out there probably might call it a spanking, but, you know, for people from young urban communities or from young people of color, we call that uh, put uh, – putting in work on somebody. I mean, you know, putting them things on somebody. I mean, Alabama whooped Georgia 41-24. to 24, And like I said, man, it was competitive for like a quarter, a quarter and a half. As Georgia, I think, got up maybe by as much as 10 points at one point. But then beyond that point, they really just did not do, you know, anything to deserve to be in that game. For anyone who watched it, um... We uh, we have been uh, starting a quarterback throughout the year, a uh, uh, young man by the name of uh, Stetson Bennett. And what's so odd about this is that uh, JT Daniels was the original starting quarterback this year, but he had a – I think he's had some injuries along the way. I think he had some, like, some weird injury, some chest, some weird uh, rib injury, uh, like some, some other kind of chest issues. Early in the year, and it eventually got to the point where JT missed maybe like two or three games before he was able to even come back at all. I think he still was maybe deemed up when he came back. But Stetson Bennett has been a guy who's been at Georgia since like 2017, maybe 2018. And he was a walk-on. He wasn't a guy that that was given what you call a preferred scholarship. He wasn't some highly sought-after player that everybody across the country wanted. Uh, Stetson Bennett is maybe like 5'11-ish, maybe like 195, you know, small, skinny-looking dude, and, uh, you know, not big by any stretch of the imagination. He's undersized. And ironically, Stetson Bennett is probably the same size as the quarterback for Alabama, Bryce Young. But as people saw who watched that game, Bryce Young uh, – uh, is in contention for the Heisman Trophy, and by given by what I saw, he won the Heisman Trophy by really, really, really putting a beating on Georgia's pass defense. I mean, uh, when you're watching that game, if you're a Georgia fan, you were probably just so so frustrated uh, by what you were seeing, because with the few times that Bryce Young did get pressured by Georgia's defensive line in that game. He always seemed to have a counterplay that was just as effective. He had a play that matched what they were doing. And, and that's what was so ironic, was that when, when you're watching Bryce Bryce Young, you, you, you're like, wow, it's like whatever – UGA tried to do with it, with it sending the blitz at him or just letting their defensive line, uh, you know, try to get to him. It just never worked. He was a guy, he, he always seemed to make the right decision, whether it was a short area throw to the outside 
or a brief little scramble to get a first down. He always had a play to match what they were doing. It was as if Alabama was in the huddle with Georgia when they ran defensive plays at times. It was it was crazy. That was flat out crazy. And like I said, you know, uh, Bryce Young had over 400 yards passing. He had four or five touchdowns that he threw in that game. And when you get it done like that, he pretty much has set himself up, uh, you know, to win, you know, the Heisman Trophy. Because really before that game, it, the Heisman Trophy picture was not very clear, you know, for a lot of people. You had Bryce Young, who had been mentioned already, which you had the guy C.J. I think it was C.J. Stroud over there at Ohio State. And you maybe had a few other guys that were out there. But it wasn't an overwhelming favorite. But Bryce Young, who, who was a quarterback for Alabama, was going up against the number one team in the country at the time, the Georgia Bulldogs, and the number one defense. And he shredded them. He had 421 yards passing and 461 total yards. So he just told you how, about how just how explosive he was and, you know, just how efficient he was in that game. Alabama had two receivers, Jamison Williams, who I think went for over 100 and some yards in that game receiving. He made some real big catches, like two very big catches in that game that Jamison Williams. He got well over 100 yards. And I think John Meshi, who was the number two receiver, he had over 100 yards in that game. So they, they really put a hurting on Georgia. And it just showed you um, how efficient their passing game was, how explosive they were. And – it shows you what a team needs to succeed, uh, you know, in today's environment. Um, one of the issues that I was going to get to with UGA was that UGA really had played a really good team since they played Clemson, like in the first good game, uh, in the first game this year. They had played like a, a, a program that was either equal to them or better than them. Like in that Clemson game, I think the score, it was a defensive game. It was like it was a real low score, but Georgia was able to eke a win out of that. But their defense, especially their secondary, has not been tested until they play Alabama. And that was the problem with UGA, is that it's easy to look great on defense when you're playing talent that is lesser than you. And that's been part of their problem. They just really weren't tested like that. People were talking about how great they were, uh, you know, how about how, how good they look. Nobody, uh, you know, people only averaging seven, ten points a game against them or whatever it was, something real low. And they were just uh, just top shelf in a lot of defensive categories until Saturday night. They pretty much got lucky because the, the starter running back for Alabama, Brian Robinson, he was pretty much coming off of, of, of a game which he was he kind of got deemed up. He wasn't playing at 100%. And he still, had, to me, had a solid game. He wasn't spectacular, but he was solid. He had some nice little short runs. He had some pass, catch, pass catching uh, out of the backfield. Uh, and he actually had a pretty good game. I actually liked what he did. But obviously, you know, the receiving was what stood out. And Georgia's DBs, were just, they were just kind of set ablaze. I mean, they got they got dusted. I mean, I mean they, they got smoked. Uh, Keely Ringo, who was a high school All-American last year when he came to Georgia, he just didn't look like – he like an average cornerback. The other guy who was a starting cornerback, the dude that came from uh, Clemson, he played at Clemson last year, but he transferred to Georgia this year. Ken, uh, Kendrick uh, – yeah, I think it was, it, was, it was Dre Kendrick or whatever the guy's name is. He, he was getting smoked. I mean, both of them had really rough games. Uh, I, there was a few – uh, pass coverages that were bust, meaning that Georgia kind of had some miscommunication that led to big plays being made by Clemson. And it just exposed them. for They almost look – they didn't even look like a top-10 team. They didn't even look like a top-10 team at all on, on defense. They they it like a joke. you like, this is the number one defense in the country. Alabama just shredding them like this. And it almost it almost was, was humorous to even suggest that. Keep in mind, Alabama uh, had been beaten this year by Texas A&M. Texas A&M is clearly a lesser team than Georgia from position to position. They don't have the talent, but they managed to come up with a scheme that defeated Alabama. Georgia could not do that. Alabama dictated the pace of the game, and they had the Georgia defense on their heels. Again, 
I think that exposed Georgia because they're not used to playing elite level talent uh, week in, week out, even though they're in the SEC. They finally got to that point, and you saw what happened. Uh, another thing uh, that I think is a huge weakness for Georgia, and it's really been that way since Kirby Smart has started coaching five or six years ago. And this, this may sound a little weird, and this may be a little long-winded in my response, is that uh, you have what you call a lot of Herschel-holics at Georgia. What do I mean when I say that? As you can see with the little screenshot that's been up for like 10 minutes now, um, who I have pictured here in a couple different picks is probably considered to be the school's greatest player who was a running back in the early 80s named Herschel Walker. Uh, Georgia run, they won the national championship where Herschel was a freshman. And Herschel ran for over 1,600 yards. And I think the next couple of years, he was averaging over 1,800 yards, you know, uh, a game. And it seems like that a lot of fans, even in today's world, they're stuck on seeing like another Herschel Walker or they're hoping to see that again. It's like their minds refuse to even come up to today's game. And not just the fans. As I mentioned before, I said something about the head coach, Kirby Smart. I think Kirby Smart's the same way. He, he it's, it's like a philosophical thing. Herschel was so good that everyone almost makes every year for there to be like a Herschel Walker-like talent at that position, no matter what era of football we're in. The problem with that is that we're in the era where what is the NFL or college where passing is what is in vogue and having an elite passing game is what people want to see. And, and, and uh, not, not just with the fans, but on the field, the coaches are really sort of like uh, bringing in coordinators who can sort of instill an elite passing game on offense. Kirby Smart seems to be one of the few coaches he will see like balance. Oh, let me see like, let me, or at least he kind of, he at least kind of leads you to believe that. Because if you really look at Georgia's stats, it seems like Kirby Smart is perfectly fine. If Georgia has like 40, 42 uh, rushes a game in terms of uh, uh, running back carries and maybe just 20, 25 passes a game. Oh, oh, we won. Oh, that's fine. The issue with that, and it has been, is that UGA is not developing their passing talent. And this is something that has really baffled me since Kirby Smart has been there. You may see a guy have a game at UGA where he, he'll, may, he'll have like 100 yards in one game. And, and for the most part, especially at receiver, you might not hear nothing from that guy for the next several games. He might have two or three catches a game, but there's nothing that you'll notice or that you'll remember. Um, and, and that's what's kind of – that's a weakness to me is that Kirby Smart still won't see just as much running as he wants to uh, see pass, uh, or if not more so, he, he wants to see passing. And that has just baffled me with him. And I don't understand that. And I think a lot of other people have mentioned, other YouTubers like Uncle Lewis said something like this, you know, and I, I, I just, I don't know, I don't get that. I really do not understand that. Is how can you try to balance the offensive approach when the today's game is not indicative of having that mindset. You have a quarterback throw over 4,000 yards, both in the pros and in college. The, most teams ain't thinking about a running back. Run, running backs have been dramatically devalued, not at UGA. Uh, for years, if people have followed uh, UGA football, uh, uh, the school has been known to be what you call tailback U. Now, obviously because of Herschel Walker, but you had other guys like Garrison Hurst, who came along in the early 90s. Uh, you had, of course, uh, No Sean Marino, who was there uh, in the late in the late two thousands, like two thousand seven, maybe what the two thousand nine. No Sean Marino was there. He went. He played for the Denver Broncos for like two or three years, maybe. And then, of course, you had probably the next best running back considered to be after after Herschel. Uh, it may, it may be debatable, but Todd Gurley, who got there in uh, two thousand twelve. Uh, uh, you've had uh, the most recent guys who were really good at times were uh, uh, especially Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle, who came maybe with a, 
uh, a couple of years after a year or two after Todd Gurley got there. So you've had guys who've had really good talent who come along. And don't let me forget DeAndre Swift. He he got he got drafted last year by Detroit Lions. But you've had many guys who have who've really produced numbers. But we're not in a running back era. So it's almost like whatever you think a running back should be doing, that doesn't really affect the game like that for the most part. Uh no, no, you know, and again, when I say I'm talking about like in championship situations, you'll see them maybe have like have numbers throughout the year because they're playing lesser competition. Like Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle, they put up numbers throughout their career. But when they got to the national championship, when they played Alabama, like uh, uh, for the first time when Kirby Smart was there, what years ago, what four or five years ago, when when he started coaching at UGA and they played that national championship, both Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle were pretty ineffective in that game. There weren't any big plays. Uh, what uh, what you just saw, uh, uh, in, in the conference championship this year, the running backs didn't do too much. Uh, they got another guy right now, Samir White. He's supposed to be this all-world guy. Samir hasn't really done too much since he's been. He's had a few big plays here and there, but he he hasn't been this big play guy that's consistent enough to where it would affect the, the outcome of a game. That's part of the issue that I'm I'm raising that you just can't really expect that to sort of to sort of really affect the outcome of the game. So you shouldn't emphasize a running attack. Man, and I said, going back to Kirby Smart's mindset, I think part of the reason why Kirby is not successful against teams that are just as good as Georgia or, and are better than Georgia since he's been here sometimes has been he's okay with having a substandard quarterback. And it, it's like the oddest thing. And this might be like the third thing. That I'm bringing up. It's like the oddest thing with him. Like, uh, when Jake from uh, first got to Georgia, there was already another guy who was more talented named Jacob Eason. Jacob Eason got hurt going into uh, Jake Fromm's uh, true freshman year. Jake Fromm, I think, got there a year after Jacob Eason. And so what happened is that uh, Jacob Eason had like a high ankle sprain. Jake Fromm ended up playing and – when he, given that Eason was hurt throughout most of the year, he never really had an opportunity to win his job back. So he left, I think, the following year with the Washington. I think that was Jacob Eason's second year at Georgia. And, uh, but Jake from, uh, I mean, excuse me, let me go back to Jake. Jacob Eason was like 6'5 and a half, 235, something like that. And, and Jake from was like 6'2, maybe 2'15, two, 220. Two but Jake from did not have the arm. And he and he really wasn't mobile. He was just like a a standstill quarterback. You will always hear Kirby use phraseology like, "Well, Jake Fromm is smart. He's he's an intelligent quarterback. He's smart." We saw how much that didn't mean nothing in big games. It meant nothing. Moving on from Jacob Eason, when Jake Fromm snatched his starting job up, there was another guy that came that you might know, Justin Fields. Justin Fields was the highest rated recruit probably ever, probably since Herschel Walker, they had come to Georgia. He was the highest rated recruit ever. And what happened during his true freshman year, if you watched uh uh if you watched Justin Fields, I think what was it like in 2018, he basically they turned him into a running back at times at Georgia. He carried the ball a lot. Uh, there was maybe one game where he threw it, but it was against a, a nothing team. I can't remember what the team's name was during Justin's freshman year, but he couldn't he couldn't beat out Jake Fromm. Again, Kirby thought he was smart, but we saw how Jake Fromm couldn't get it done in a big game. But again, it was an example of a better quarterback losing out to a guy who just wasn't as good physically. And I, I think Kirby's excuse was when it was – Jake puts us into the best play. I'm like, yeah, probably throughout most of the year when you're playing nothing competition, but not when you're playing top tier opponents. Uh, another case, and this is going to be the most current case. Uh, as I said, JT Daniels was a five star quarterback who came out of California. He was one of the top five quarterbacks in the country when he left high school, like in 2018, I believe, 2019. 
uh, and I, I think I've talked about this in some of my past videos, so excuse me for being repetitive. Uh, JT Daniels started throughout his true freshman year. I think he threw for like 2,800 yards, 2,700 yards, somewhere in there at USC. Then he going to his, to his true sophomore year. He blew out his knee like in the first or second game. He lost a job to Keaton Slovis. And so in his third year, he transferred to Georgia. Uh, and his third year was last year. And um, and, and what happened was that uh, JT could really never get on track uh, 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 last year for the most part till late in the year because he was coming off a serious injury. And I think later in the year, Kirby Smart spelled out the fact that he really he got the program maybe in the late summer, and they had to sort of put him on a, a recovery program where they had to monitor where he was. So JT was kind of behind and, you know, learning everything. He was playing catch-up. and so, he, But his first game in last year, he threw for, what was it, over 400 yards? He threw about four or five touchdowns. Jermaine Burton had a big game. He had like 100-some yards that game. And it was spectacular debut for JT Daniels. Enter 2021. As I just said earlier in this video, JT got hurt this year. Stetson Bennett came in. JT Davis has never really had a job, had an opportunity to come back and come, and come in the game and win his job back. So we're seeing deja vu. And I think Kirby has said, well, Stetson knows how to run an offense. Stetson Bennett was a walk-on. And I don't, that's what I don't understand by Kirby. Some guys are just better than others. And I don't think Kirby understands that. And it's the weirdest thing with him. It's like he just picks the lesser quarterback. The more talented guy might have a shot when he gets it, but he ends up getting hurt. And when Kirby Smart does, he just said, forget the less talented guy. I'm going to go, excuse me, uh, forget going with the more talented guy. I'm going to go with the less talented guy. And I think as long as he has that mentality, it's going to kill UGA's ability to be competitive. It's going to absolutely just kill their ability to be competitive against opponents who are just as good, if not better than them. And Kirby Smart wanted to get away from that mentality. And like I said, those three reasons are the big reasons why I think why Georgia suffers in big games since Kirby Smart has been here. I want to like Kirby Smart as a coach. He's very passionate. He, 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 he recruits the heck up out of people. He does a ton of recruiting like, like, like throughout the year. He's a very passionate looking guy. He's, he's born and raised in Georgia. He, in fact, played football in Georgia like in the late 90s. I think he was like a safety or something. He maybe was all conference like his last year. But he he's, as Uncle Lou says here on YouTube, he's quarterback retarded. The last thing I'm going to get to before I close out, that's a weakness for UGA, and is that, and I know people notice this, if you take your eyes away from the TV from like maybe a few seconds, or if George is going through an offensive possession, you'll notice that when you get back on the TV, uh, there'll be different sets of players out there like that in the same possession. It seems like every two plays, Georgia sh uh, shuffles in different players. And that really just has irked the crap out of me throughout Kirby's team because I don't understand it. I, 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 I function with the mindset, yeah, man, some people just better than others. Some people just, And let them stay out there the whole possession and see what they can do. Well, I don't care whether it's a Zamir White at running back James Cook at running back, whoever it is, it's different players like every two plays. As a, as a offensive uh, player, I would be really, really perturbed by that. And I, I'm saying to myself, I can't get into no rhythm. I can't get into no rhythm doing this bull crap. They even do that sometimes with linemen. And to me, that really creates inefficiency with linemen when they do that. Because they're always shuffling people in, in and out of plays. Like, and it's, it's really aggravating when you watch it. I'm like, can they stop doing that? And I think that will lead to some some guys making, you know, big making more plays because they have more opportunities instead of getting shuffled in and out like that. Because it, it's stupid. It don't make sense. Why would you shuffle in guys in and out like that when, when it creates inefficiencies? And I just, I don't I don't understand it. So it's a philosophical thing that I think that's killing Kirby Smart. He's a Herschel Hawley, and that he's always shuffling guys in and out, and he's he's somewhat quarterback retarded. Like he just he don't understand that the most talented guy to be on the field. The last thing I want to hit on before I close out, and I just thought about this, 
was the uh, freshman tight end Brock Bowers for UGA, who's out of California. That that young man is unbelievable. He, he's incredible. How he hasn't been in contention for the John Mackey Award for the nation's tight end, I don't even know. He clearly is the best tight end in the country who's had an incredible impact. To me, that's been the missing link for Georgia. They're, they're all, their passing offense, to me, has been more has been better this year, a, a little bit better because they got the ball to a guy who's a true pass catcher. They already have uh, uh, Darnell Washington, and as you all have probably known from even previous videos I've done, Arik Gilbert, who's another All American, who who's at Georgia. He hadn't even played the whole year. He hadn't even been with the team like that. So I don't know what his future is going to be. But Brock Bowers has been incredible. I think he has over like seven hundred yards, maybe uh, catching, and how he is in on. Uh, on uh, uh, the John Mackey Award list for the top tight in the country, I don't even know. That's a joke to me. I mean, to me, that 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 young guy's been shafted, and I mean, there's no way he should be number two or three in terms of tight end talent. Because he's a, he's the best tight end in the country this year. He's spectacular. I expect great things from him. So uh, I just wanted to give my opinion on what I've seen from the Georgia Bulldogs this year, and I want to talk about some of the weaknesses that have been kind of like going through my mind. Uh, let me say that, as you all probably know, Georgia's not at the playoff uh, in terms of the college playoff system. They're going to be playing Michigan on December 31st, I believe. And if they beat Michigan, they'll be probably uh, going to play Alabama again. But Alabama has played Cincinnati. So, uh, you know, they're, they're probably playing against Alabama. I think Alabama's going to kill Cincinnati. But uh, And if so, we'll see if Kirby Smart can get out of some of those habits and lead the Bulldogs to a national title. Uh, some people are picking Michigan over Georgia because Michigan's run game has been spectacular. I think Georgia can shut that down, but again, it's going to probably depend on the quarterback play. And I guess we'll find out on December 31st. So uh, she got J crew to you coming at you with an overdue video here on YouTube. Uh, we'll see what them Bulldogs going to do over the next several weeks. Y'all have a good one.